My name is Andrew Pickford. I'm a senior fellow at Mancal Economic Education Foundation. Uh, Mancal is very pleased to work with the Murdoch Law School for this conference and we hope to turn this into a regular event. So thank you very much. Now, in terms of the keynote presentation, I can't think of anyone more qualified to speak on this issue than Chris Berg. Chris is a, a research fellow with the Institute of Public Affairs. He writes regularly for the Sunday Age, Sydney Morning Herald, and extremely often for The Drum, where I often see his work. Uh, he was a previous editor of IPA Review, and his latest book, In Defence of Freedom of Speech, From Ancient Greece to Andrew Bolt, uh, is, is effectively on this topic. There's some still available in the foyer for sale, uh, if you're interested. And following the keynote presentation by Chris Berg, uh, Mancal Chairman Ron Manners will sum up, as he always does, and uh, formally conclude the conference. So please, everyone, welcome Chris Berg to the lectern to, to discuss threats to freedom of speech. Thank you, Andrew. I have um, uh, the honour of following so many distinguished lawyers, so uh, uh, I will rather than focus on the specifics of the legal framework surrounding freedom of speech and as we've discussed the many exceptions and concerns that we have with it, I'm going to trace the origins of some of the threats and how those origins I think undermine the validity of many of the or of much of the received wisdom about freedom of speech. Today we've discussed many of the threats, as I said. We've discussed the Gillard government's attack on freedom of the press through the Finkelstein and Convergence reviews. We've discussed racial vilification laws, which have enshrined a right not to be offended, and in my view, undermined our liberal notions of public debate. More on that in a moment. But these are hardly the only threats to free speech. Let me just explore a few all within the last year alone. At the height of the recent debate over the so-called Twitter trolls, the New South Wales police minister said, and I'll quote him, we've got to empower police with the ability to replace these trolls keyboards with handcuffs, grab them by the ears from mummy's basement, and take them down to the local police station. This simply for writing 140 characters on the internet. It sounds like a tyrannical idea to me, but it's exactly what happens in the United Kingdom right now. In March, a 21-year-old man was arrested at 2.45 a.m. in the morning for drunkenly abusing a footballer on Twitter. He received 56 days jail. In July, a 17-year-old boy was arrested for abusing a British Olympic athlete. athlete. And just this week, a 19-year-old man got three months jail for posting comments on Facebook about a missing girl. His comments were despicable and offensive, but three months jail just for writing words. Yet for ministers and police commissioners around Australia, the issue with the Twitter trolls debate seems to be that Twitter is just a foreign company and they won't reveal their users without a warrant. This debate had national press that you would have all seen and it revealed a disturbing antipathy towards free speech by the people who are supposed to protect it. There are more stories. Earlier this month, we discovered that the movement alert list, which is the immigration watch list designed to control who visits Australia, is being used to adjudicate political opinions. The Dutch MP Gert Wilders had his visa application held up because apparently he has character of concern. This is obviously entirely because of his views about multiculturalism and Islam. Wilders was eventually given his visa, but only after a six-week delay and after he had been forced to cancel his tour. The broader question past Wilders is this. Why is the Immigration Department deciding what political opinions Australians can responsibly hear? The High Court is currently hearing a case between two street preachers and the nation's attorney generals as to whether a local council can ban people from preaching or canvassing in a public space. 
It's hearing another case about whether the Commonwealth can prohibit people from sending offensive material through the post. And we've already had two major cases in the High Court this year that attempt to define how far our freedom of political communication extends. In both cases, that right has been drawn narrowly. We have some sort of right to free speech, but the High Court doesn't want to tell us what it is. Jim Allen, my friend, wants to keep human rights out of the hand of unelected judges. I can understand that, Jim, but it is far too late. And now, having granted us freedom of speech, we still have no idea what they are talking about. Anyway, it goes on. Last week, the Sydney radio broadcaster Alan Jones was found to have breached New South Wales Racial Vilification Acts over a broadcast in 2005. There have been calls for the Australian Press Council to ban the words loony, bonkers and wacko because they could be insulting to people with mental illness. The Press Council's head, Julian Disney, has described these calls as important and persuasive. <laughs> The communications regulator has imposed new conditions on Carl Sanderlin's, threatening to take away his station's license if he is not decent. There is a movement in the United Nations to introduce blasphemy laws into human rights treaties. There's a move by, the UN bureaucracy, by a UN bureaucracy to regulate the very structure of the internet, which would have huge freedom of speech consequences as well. Now, every attack on freedom of expression has its history. It was political glass jaws that led to the government's Finkelstein inquiry. It was childish paternalism that led to Stephen Conroy's proposed internet filter. But how the totalitarian dictatorship of the Soviet Union gave us the right not to be offended, that is the right that Andrew Bolt and Alan Jones and those boys in Britain apparently breached, I think is the most revealing of all. So let me take us on a short historical diversion and pose this question. Should Nazis be allowed freedom of speech? In 2012, this is an interesting hypothetical. But at the end of the Second World War, it was an extremely pressing question as the world was trying to create a post-war framework for international human rights law. The issue was the drafting of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights which was finally adopted by the United Nations in late 1948. It is in this debate that we see the origins and invention of a right not to be offended and the origins of the waning support for freedom of expression in the West. To understand free speech in 2012, you have to go back to the early Cold War. Now, the Universal Declaration is the foundation of modern international human rights law. It is purely aspirational, but it provides a touchstone for domestic debate about human rights. These, these declarations, and there are others as well, are treated in much of Australian politics as gospel somehow, as if individual rights had been codified for the first time, perfectly and forever, by the UN. The Gillard government's national curriculum will teach the very idea of human rights as if it was invented by UN bureaucrats. But the United Nations wasn't trying to decide what was a right and what was it was not. It was actually juggling great power politics between the Western world and the Soviet bloc. So when it came to tackle freedom of speech, in the Declaration of Human Rights, there was a huge disagreement between the Soviets and the West. The Soviet Union obviously didn't protect free speech at all. In 1948, there were 2.2 million people in the Gulag system for political offenses. One Russian novelist at the time wrote that what in the West is considered Soviet censorship is really nothing less than the Soviet air that one breathes. But of course, the UN is the UN, so the Soviets were allowed to decide what constituted our human right to free speech. Article 19 of the draft declaration reads, everyone has the right to freedom of opinion and expression. The Soviets wanted to add that freedom of speech and the press should not be used to propagate fascism 
aggression or provoke hatred between nations. They also wanted the UN to allow governments to ban any organization of a fascist or anti-democratic nature. Now, we think of fascism and Nazism as a variety of socialist thought. After all, national socialism was all about government control over the economy and society. But the Soviets thought otherwise. They thought that fascism was a heresy of capitalism, not a heresy of socialism. As the Soviet delegation said, fascist elements exist in almost every European country except those with a people's democracy. The Western powers quickly realized that the Soviets were less concerned with fascism and more concerned with suppressing anti-communism. As one Canadian participant said, the term fascism once had a definite meaning, but it is now being blurred by the abuse of applying it to any person or idea which was not communist. In this case, luckily, the Western powers won the vote. The Universal Declaration, as it stands, takes a pro-free speech position. But two decades later, the United Nations was preparing the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. The same fight occurred. The Western countries proposed limiting restraints to speech, proposed limiting restraints on speech to those that were merely an incitement to violence, as per ancient common law. The Soviet Union said, no, we should extend those restraints to incitement to hatred. Once again, the Western powers objected. The Australian delegation said that people could not be legislated into morality. This time, however, the West lost. We lost the vote in the UN and an expansive right which now bans incitement to discrimination, hostility or violence was adopted. The same fight occurred during the drafting of the International Covenant on the Elimination of All Racial Discrimination. Here, the restriction on freedom of speech is even more strident. All signatories must declare an offence punishable by, by law all dissemination of ideas based on racial superiority or hatred or incitement to racial discrimination. Again, this clause was driven by the communist bloc against the, the protest of the Western powers. I really like this comment by the Colombian delegation of the Western side, which said that the statement is a throwback to the past. Punishing ideas, whatever they may be, is to aid and abet tyranny and leads to the abuse of power. As far as we are concerned and as far as democracy is concerned, ideas should be fought with ideas and reasons. Theories should be refuted by arguments and not by the scaffold, prison, exile, confiscation or fines. Once more, as I said, the Western delegations which supported freedom of speech were outvoted. It is a sad reflection on Europe, wrote a Danish human rights advocate recently, that the increasing emphasis on criminalizing words that wound, offend or hurt is the brainchild of the very totalitarian states with which the Western European states were locked in an ideological battle during the Cold War. The adoption of hate speech restrictions were not intended to liberate minorities, as so many contemporary human rights advocates claim, but to restrain Democrats. In the decade following, Western countries adopted their own forms of racial discrimination laws as per the treaties they'd signed up to. They all prohibited to varying degrees hatred, discrimination, all drawing on those treaties. Of the major Western nations, only the United States now has no prohibition against hate speech. It is unlawful in Australia today to offend, insult, humiliate or intimidate another person or group of people because of their race, colour or national or ethnic origin. I won't go too much into the Andrew Bolt case because I cover it extensively in my book. He was found to have breached the Racial, uh, racial Discrimination Act. But suffice it to say that the judge found that Bolt's columns were so offensive, so unreasonable, so intolerable, that they threatened Australia's basic social cohesion. It's in the judgment. A reasonable member of the community, said the judge, believes that freedom of speech has boundaries. And when something goes beyond that boundary, an open and multicultural society will perceive it to be intolerable. In other words, 
a reasonable member of the community, according to our court system, fully supports the tone, intent, purpose and provisions of the Racial Discrimination Act. In my view, these sort of hate speech laws are a clear and fundamental threat to the right to freedom of speech. But unfortunately, we are in a minority. This is not a right that appears to be well loved anymore. In the wake of the Finkelstein inquiry, a Canberra Times columnist attacked the vast majority of internet users who pollute the World Wide Web with their unbridled and often crudely written opinions. Under the guise of freedom of speech, read another column, the internet is turning rants into mainstream debate. The title of that column was, Some Public Debate is Worth Stifling. Bob Brown even argued last year that newspapers and journalists should have to obtain a license from the government before they published. Of course, the only purpose of a license is so that you can withdraw it. In, Bob's, in Brown's words, to stop journalists to do the wrong thing in their tracks. Brown argued that free speech for the press involves, through its own code of ethics, fair speech, which comes with a high degree of responsibility. Well, no, it doesn't. A right that is in contingent on being used responsibly is not a right at all. Who, after all, would decide what constitutes responsible? In the trial of Socrates in 399 BC, it was 500 jurors that decided the elderly philosopher had unlawfully offended the Athenian community. In the Roman Empire, it was the emperor himself who would decide whether a book was treasonous. In the medieval period, it was church councils. In the early modern world, it was ecclesiastical authorities and secular bodies that banned books and burned their authors. Then <coughs> judges and censorship boards took over. Today, we have a huge body of statutory and common law, domestic precedent and international doctrine, doctrine to regulate what we can and cannot say. But freedom of speech is an outgrowth of the freedom to think, to develop our own views. After all, a freedom of conscience and, thought, conscience and thought without the freedom to express those thoughts would be an entirely hollow one. We're all familiar with some of the basic justifications for limiting free speech. You can't falsely yell fire in a crowded theater. You can't incite violence. These are all well and good in theory. But in a case in 2000 under the New South Wales Anti-Discrimination Act, a tribunal decided that for words to be considered incitement, there was no need to demonstrate that this speaker intended any incitement, nor that any incitement to violence actually occurred. It was entirely in the judge's head. And when the US Supreme Court Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes devised his famous metaphor about falsely shouting fire in a crowded theater, he left one massive question unanswered. Who decides what counts as a fire? Because Holmes used that metaphor to justify the imprisonment of a socialist who was simply distributing flyers condemning the draft during the First World War. In Holmes's mind, Criticizing government policy was the same as deliberately causing a stampede in a theater. Opposing the draft during a war was too dangerous to be protected speech, according to this reasoning. The comparison he made was absurd. But absurd comparisons are very common in free speech cases. In the Andrew Bolt case, the lawyer for the group of light-skinned Aboriginal, Aboriginal people described Bolt's columns as akin to eugenics. This kind of thinking led to the Nuremberg race laws. The Holocaust started with words and ended with violence. Now, as history, that is not true. There were enormous restrictions on freedom of speech, particularly Nazi speech during the Weimar Republic. But his purpose was obvious. He wanted to massively overstate the consequences of words, just words. Voltaire once wrote, if a country's religion is sacred, a hundred volumes written against it will do no more harm than that done to rock solid walls by a hundred thousand snowballs. 
How can a few black letters traced on paper destroy it? Every single restriction that our governments place on free speech is based on the assumption that words are insanely powerful. The words can manipulate minds, create havoc, and even, as some have argued, destroy democracy. But these restrictions assume that A, words have extraordinary powers of persuasion, and B, people are ignorant fools, credulously sucking up everything they hear. Now, sounds absurd when you put it like that. But these two assumptions are widely held, if not widely acknowledged. No one wants to say that speech needs to be restricted be because people are idiots. But how else to describe, how else to describe, for instance, plain packaging on cigarettes? Logos and colors are so deviously manipulate, manipulative that they eliminate free will and make a mockery of individual choice. Now that's an easy one. In the United States, where the First Amendment is being increasingly applied to commercial speech, courts have struck down bans on alcohol advertising, drug advertising, and tobacco advertising. In 2011, a US federal court judge ruled that regulations requiring graphic warnings on cigarette packets would not stand up to First Amendment scrutiny. Now, obviously, in Australia, we are not so protective of speech. But the assumption that people are easily misled by powerful words present more challenges to social democrats and supporters of regulation than they might realize. People might be easy to manipulate. They might be stupid. They might be credulous. They might be ignorant. But the basic principle of democracy is that they are not. That they have the capacity to participate in, at the very least, the election of their representatives. Yet there's an even more central way in which freedom of speech is, the, is a vital aspect, if not the most critical central aspect of our liberal democracy. And that is individual liberty. The Athenians and the ancient Romans had both had ideals about freedom of speech. In both cases, they were flawed ideals, but they got at one essential point. A free individual was one who held the freedom to speak. Without the freedom to speak, an individual was by definition not free. No government can control the thoughts of those they govern. The advocates of religious toleration knew this better than others. Classical opponents of persecution claimed that God did not give any person the power to police the thoughts of another person. So reasoned those advocates. He did not mean for monarchs to force religious uniformity upon their population. Benedict Spinoza wrote that everybody has an inalienable right to their thoughts. And the liberty to think is curtailed if it is not grouped with a liberty to discuss or to express the contents of our thoughts. As John Stuart Mill pointed out, the formation of those thoughts is richer, even necessarily required, when one can hear all argument freely, when discussion is not suppressed by censors. To censor, to restrain free speech, is to stifle our individual intellectual development and repress the basic moral autonomy of free individuals. But the assumption that people are easily misled by mere words and colors helps explain a great question I encountered while writing my book. Why has the modern left, by backing all these new limitations on freedom of speech and hate speech laws, abandoned their traditional support for free expression? It is easy to find historical examples of those on the left are firmly, uh, firmly opposed to censorship. Karl Marx was a passionate opponent of censorship. Press freedom was just about the only freedom he liked. It was even a left-wing film critic writing about censorship that came up with the phrase nanny state. Yet right now we have the Labor Party and the Greens lined up to propose new anti-speech laws. It is easy to call for freedom of speech when you agree with the content of that speech. And the left now occupy the institutions of power. Freedom of speech, they've decided, is less important than other goals protecting people from being offended, for instance, or the elimination of discrimination. Now, a lot of people want to protect others from harm. I can understand that. 
but now they want to protect them from simply hearing words that they do not like. So while obviously conservatives, liberals and libertarians believe that the principle of individual liberty is too important to be discarded, the real ideological debate, in my view, is elsewhere. This is about paternalism. There are a number of people, a number of governments and a number of politicians in Australia who do not believe that people are smart enough to responsibly listen to the opinions of others. One of the founders of the Russian radical tradition during the Tsarist regime was named Alexander Radishchev. He published a book in 1790 called Journey from St. Petersburg to Moscow. His book was written during what was described as a relatively, relatively tolerant reign, that of Catherine, de Gra uh, Catherine the Great, one of those enlightened, uh, enlightened mon uh, monarchs loved by intellectuals at the time. Yet Catherine had Radishchev's book destroyed, and Radishchev himself self condemned to death. Yet in his ill-fated book, this Russian radical gives what I think is the definitive argument against banning speech that offends or hurts our moral sensibilities. He writes, the censorship of what is printed belongs properly to society. Leave what is stupid to the judgment of public opinion. Stupidity will find a thousand censors. But the most vigilant police cannot check worthless ideas as well as a disgusted public can. To defend freedom of speech is not to say that words cannot be cruel or that speech cannot be hurtful or offensive or obscene. But it is to acknowledge a basic truth. To restrain speech is to assert the power of government where no such power can exist over our individual thoughts and our individual consciences. Thank you very much. And now to conclude the, uh, the formal conference, Ron Manners. Good. Is there a presentation for it? Is this